So I'm going to talk a bit about today is the Adobe journey from a, a zero trust perspective. So what it is we're working to accomplish, what we tried to work on as far as the foundation. So what did we feel was important to have in place as we went down that journey? Uh, how we accomplished it, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the details as to what we implemented, what was important to us. And then finally, some conclusions, a few learnings we want to be able to share, because one of the key pieces here is being able to share the information back so that when you go to your own organizations or you're considering a zero trust platform for your own uh, companies or whatever it might be, you can maybe learn from what we have and determine what would, be fit, what would fit your own environment, what you might need to consider. So first off, you know, the why and the what. What is it that inspired us to go down this path uh, several years ago now? So starting off with, you know, why do we even need it? What was important about a zero trust solution that we wanted to be able to spend our time focusing on it? There's a couple key things that I would call out. Uh, one of the first ones is just primarily that authentication was not granular enough. And that was just really based on the reality that much of the attack vectors, uh, the security tools we had in place historically, just were no longer sufficient to meet what we felt were the, the new risks that we saw out there. A great example is, and I'm sure as many of you know, is it used to be that a, a robust firewall with all the right policies was largely sufficient. For Adobe anyway, we felt that, that was no longer adequate for what we wanted to protect and how we wanted to be able to analyze who was accessing what data. And then from the, the techniques and the tools, the adversaries, you know, the piece I'd call out there is just the things have changed. Um, I've been at Adobe for over 20 years, and I remember originally when we started rolling out an MFA solution, that seemed to be the end all. And okay, we fixed all the problem. Nobody can hack anything anymore because we have MFA everywhere, so we should be set. But nowadays, there's so many advanced techniques, you know, advanced spear phishing to specifically designed to work around your MFA solutions that we really realized that we had some gaps there. And so our zero trust journey was really about identifying those, what were the key pieces we wanted to have, and how do we deliver something that both empowers a user, makes the user, um, improves the user experience, but also meets our security guidelines. So first off, um, what is it? So what did we come up with? And this is not unique. This is just, you know, I'm going to talk about our, the Adobe imp implementation. Is we really decided that we want to go with a model that included both authentication for the device and the user, and how do we use that telemetry to make a set of decisions? And at the same time, knowing that there had been a real change in the way that many of our employees and the way many of our partners and vendors worked, how do we also reflect the fact that most of, or much of the data we now have is in a SaaS application or out there in the cloud? So being able to really reflect that and move some of that security control out to the endpoint because it's no longer going to be sufficient to have everything depend upon the corporate network and the controls we might have in place there. And so that was really the kind of the, the growth of what we identified as some of our gaps and where we wanted to go down the, the path of using both the device and the user from an authentication perspective. So the purpose, you know, what is it we were trying to really work towards resolving is I think a couple of things come out. One is we really want to become more of a cloud-like state, transform most of our services, whether they were on-prem or in the cloud, having a common set of way of interacting with the data, making it easier for the user to interact with the, uh, the information. So really maturing that from both a, a user experience but also from the security side as well. And then we also really wanted to reduce the amount of requirements that you be either on-prem or use a VPN solution. You know, traditionally, VPN tends to be a very wide open solution. It's a tunnel to the entire network. We were looking for something that was much more granular, had the access of a, a least privileged model. So if you're accessing a certain service, it was tied to that service, not to the entire subnet or a, a VLAN. And then really also you know, improving the security and the granularity of what the access is that we're granting. So having it more, um, more targeted, that least privileged model, again, where as opposed to being on the corporate network or a traditional VPN solution where you have access to everything, it's targeted to what you really need to do your job or what you're trying to access for that particular service. So the foundation. So what is it we wanted to work on in order to get to that point? What is it we felt was important for us to work on as, a, as an organization? Uh, so f starting off with you know, where we were at, a lot of our internal applications just uh, didn't have a seamless offering. You know, they were very independent uh, workflows that might, um, the user might get used to different ways of authenticating to the service. They may have still met our standards, but there wasn't really a seamless way of interacting with them. It was important for us to improve the user experience in addition to security when it came to zero trust solutions. It also was not very granular. You know, we didn't have a lot of granular controls around both the user and the device that were used in making access decisions. It was just primarily the user as far as do you have access to an application? Okay, then you must be trusted. And we wanted to really up-level that to a much more secure type of offering. And then, you know, application authentication and, and standardization is, it sounds like a lot of buzzwords, but it was an opportunity for us to really move many of our applications, especially those that were internal, that used a variety of ways to authenticate, to more of a standard that was both easier for the user to interact with 
and also much more seamless and more secure by default. And this is kind of that, that mantra we had early on where we wanted to up-level, be more cloud-like for our applications, regardless of where they were hosted, but also make it easier for the user to interact with the data in a secure fashion. So the goals, these are kind of the things that we really outlined were important to us in order to be able to solve and show the value of our zero trust offering. The user experience, you know, I've mentioned that several times and um, I'm sure you all think it's important, hopefully you do. You know, security for security's sake wasn't enough, so we really wanted to improve the user experience and really re reduce the reliance on a VPN solution every time they had to access, say, just a web portal. So that was a really important piece for us. And it also meant really looking at how to improve the security associated with that from a network perspective. So our zero trust solution was really important to make sure that we limit your access to what you need to do your job, but do that all silently or, or seamlessly in the background so the user doesn't have to worry about whether they're on the VPN network, at home, in the office. It all works in a very straightforward fashion is independent of any, any particular network connection they might have. And then, you know, an added benefit here, of course, is just eliminating some of that lateral movement. So if you're not in a VPN tunnel, if you don't have access to the entire network, it's very hard to exploit a neighboring service or a neighboring host because you only have access to what you need, you only have access to that service or particular protocols. And then, you know, the protecting internal applications. This was something that, you know, again, was an added benefit. And the added benefit was that by re restricting or reducing the access to a service to just what was required, you kind of reduce that, uh, the number of threats that can attack your service, you know, the number of ways to interact with it. It has to be much more sanitized, it has to follow a set of standards that are easier to audit, easier to enforce, and again, are very limited to just what should be allowed or desired for that particular service or application. So the existing investments, so I'm gonna talk about just a couple of these. Um, none of them are really big surprises, but it was important for us to look at our existing investments, our infrastructure, our workflows, and how do we take advantage of those in order to be able to show the value. When Adobe started at Zero Trust Solution, it was really, um, there wasn't a lot of resources. I mean, this was kind of early on in the process. There was not a big blank check waiting for us to you know, implement some big solution. So how did we take advantage of what was already there to show value early on? And so a couple of key things stand out. One, we really wanted to be able to build upon what we already had from an authentication perspective. So it had to work with our Okta solution. Um, in this case, that's what we tied a lot of it to and we're able to use the Okta and the group information, the Azure infrastructure in order to make decisions, intelligent decisions about the device, the user and what they should be able to authorize access to. Logging, I'm gonna, I wanna spend just a second talking about logging. That sounds very generic and I'm not talking about logging here in the sense of being able to audit information after the fact, but it was really important for us to make decisions about the roadmap. And I'll give you a couple of examples. We didn't, you know, when we started down this process, we had a lot of assumptions about what apps, what services would be appropriate for the Zero Trust uh, solution and how our users interact with it. But those were assumptions. And, you know, I've been at Adobe a long time, so it could be that my assumptions were 10 years old and they need to be reevaluated. So we really spent a lot of time looking at what were the most commonly used services? How were they interacted with? What types of devices were being used to access that data? Because that all played a key role in determining how do we want to prioritize the work we're going to do from a zero trust model. And at the same time, it was also critical for us to be able to show value early on in the process back to our key executive stakeholders and the users by knowing that we spent the time to, to come up with a solution that worked for how they actually currently interact with the data, as opposed to something brand new that maybe didn't fit their use case or was more challenging to use. And then the last two, you know, I think they're pretty straightforward, but this was really an attempt and our desire to move beyond just having a policy that says this is what a managed device might look like, or this is what we expect as a secure device to look like, but codifying that in a set of technical controls. So if you're missing something, if you don't have the EDR client uh, installed that we expect to see on your device, we'll make a decision about that. And that decision might be that you're not gonna have access, you know, it's, that's the most common one, but there could be other decisions or criteria that might play a role in that and how that affects the score of your device. And that was important for us to build upon all the work that had been done to get an EDR client out there to define the standards for what we expected to see from a managed device. So how we did it. So we're just gonna spend, uh, I'm gonna spend a couple minutes here talking about some of the technical things we did and uh, kind of where we evolved to as well. So where are some of the future things we've done recently and, and where we're going next. So starting off, a couple of things I'd call out is we uh, deployed certificates to all of the managed devices. Those certificates are used as part of the auth process. So when a user hits a service, it uh, gets, there's a redirect through Okta and our VMware VIDM solution that looks for the certificate. If the certificate's present, it does the, all the associated checks to make sure the certificate's valid, you know, it meets some criteria. And in that certificate, it's enough information to make a determination about the device and the user in combination. So actually there's a real-time check to our Workspace ONE um, API endpoint, checking for the status of that device, checking for the status of that certificate, ensuring that it's checked in recently or it meets any other criteria. 
And then there's you know, other information that feeds into that as well from part of the trust scoring. There's a little bit more in the evolving piece that I'll talk about here in a few minutes, but really looking at what else can we get from our EDR or other information about the device to make, and the user to make a decision about the access they might get. And then finally, from the Okta and the Azure side, this is you know, more for the user. So we, you know, we have the device piece worked out with the certificate from the user side, really using that information we get from VIDM and some of the other tools to make decisions about what are they authorized to access. I think a great example would be is um, some of our services are limited based on the employee type. You know, are you a partner, a regular employee, an intern? And so taking that criteria as well to make all those decisions at the time of, of authentication to the service to determine what kind of access might be granted or if any other controls are required before access can be granted. So next, this is just actually a little bit more about the, the web piece of it, because we really started with the web proxy um, and making a lot of internal services available in addition to the SaaS-based offerings. So the certificates on the device, that, so you know, there's certain key things that have to happen before you can even be part of the service or take advantage of the service. Your device has to be properly managed. It has to have the right certificate on the device. When you hit a uh, URL, when the end user hits the right URL, the certificate actually, um, the redirect through Okta and VIDM prompts the device for the certificate. That certificate includes enough information about the device, such as the, the user, the device information, the information that you'd look up in essentially our MDM solution to get information about the, uh, the device. So for a great example would be, is the device still compliant? You know, has it checked in recently? Uh, does it meet other policy requirements that are required for accessing a particular data set? So all of that happens seamlessly in the background. And from the user perspective, they just simply went to a URL. They wouldn't know if it's a on-prem uh, web application, maybe it's the wiki page or some other service, Jira, or if it's just a cloud-based application, for them it's just a URL, regardless of what network they're on. This happens silently in the background, and those set of criteria are then used to make determinations about the access that should be granted. And again, this, this highlights two key things that I would call out is, here's the technical piece, but the technical piece is really being used here to improve the user experience. And that was, again, a kind of a key mantra we had, and I'll talk a little bit about why that was important here in, in just a minute. As far as where we've evolved and where we're going, a couple of additional things I'd call out. Uh, what are other usage patterns we want to be able to include in our zero trust model? So web proxies was a great early win, and that showed a lot of value. Uh, but what can we do beyond that? You know, we have a lot of developers, so can we make SSH and RDP available? What would it take for Git tools or developer tools to be available? So we've gone through and worked through those models in order to be able to really offer a, a variety of solutions that fit many different, or several different use cases at least. We also wanted to have more granularity in the controls we were putting in place. So we took certain applications and actually applied a, a greater level of security around it, whereby it wasn't enough to meet a basic standard, but there were additional things that we would potentially check about your device, such as, all right, so is it compliant? Has it checked in recently into the Workspace ONE module? But also, is the firewall running? Or is it a certain OS version? All those were additional features that were added to some of the uh, more sensitive apps, more sensitive services we wanted to apply a higher level of security to. And then the other thing I'd call out on here, too, is the, um, the piece that's the uh, access mesh. That, that's with our, working with our vendor, Banyan. It, again, going to a, an approach that was focused on the technical and the security side, but also the user side, how do we make sure that this is reliable? Because we come up with a great service, but if it's not going to function on a day-to-day -day basis for our users, it's not going to get used. And so we work closely with them and in our own internal teams to come up with a solution that's uh, available in all the different regions we have from a cloud perspective. And it doesn't matter whether you're in our office in, in India, an office in EMEA, or in North America, you're gonna get a similar experience. You don't need to worry about any of that. It's load balanced, it allows us to do all the right infrastructure upgrades without having downtime for the user perspective. To the point now where if there is an impact, we hear about it immediately. And so we know that there's you know, a lot of real, really great work that was done to make that available. It also was a, an effort for us to treat it more cloud-like by automating as much as possible how we manage the infrastructure. So it was you know, both the security side, but also making it more cloud-like in the sense of treating the infrastructure, treating the deployments like a cloud deployment, and, and doing the same kind of um, development and release cycle that we would for our other products. So where we're at right now as far as the deployment, what have we, what have we accomplished, what have we been able to do? We've deployed certificates that are used for the overall workflow to over 45,000 devices. So that means 45,000 devices are, are now appropriately managed, have a policy applied to them, and have the certificate that they would need in order to take advantage of the Zero Trust solution. We've uh, deployed, rather, the, the entire workflow to over 2,000 applications. This is a combination of the Okta VIDM uh, Zen workflow, is what we like to call it, so that the apps will automatically try and take advantage of the certificate and use that as a part of the access decision and the authentication uh, workflow for any of those particular applications or those users if they're approved. 
And then finally, over 100 applications, it's actually probably close to 150 now, have been made available via our proxy solution. So this is the, the scenario where we no longer, or we limited the needs for users to have to use VPN every time they just say need access to a web portal that might be internal or uh, the Jira instance. So this was a really big win and it was something that added value on day one. And then uh, we've also actually done quite a bit of work to look for other non-web-based solutions. This is the, the example here is Git. But what else can we offer in order to improve security but make the user ex experience a little bit easier by offering more than just a web browser front-end solution for you know, web-based apps? So that's really you know, kind of where we're at. Um, we have uh, thousands of users and we're serving up all these applications. And I want to talk just a little bit about how this was important to us at the beginning of the pandemic and some of the conclusions we want to be able to share with, with the group here. So the learnings and conclusions, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the pandemic. And, and I'm sure everyone here, or many of you were in the same boat, I remember being at work and getting an email one day saying, hey, don't show up to work tomorrow. And then of course there was a bunch of meetings showing up, well, what does that mean? You know, what do we do from a security perspective? What do we do from a uh, infrastructure perspective? Can we support everybody over VPN? What risks is that now creating that we hadn't considered. And so by having this in place largely before the pandemic started, we really were able to ramp it up. And so there was a smaller team that really focused on, okay, now that we've made this decision where everybody's gonna work remote, what are the most commonly used services? What can we learn from what we've done so far? And you know, really target those and get them involved in the process right away. So that starting tomorrow, starting next week, you know, whatever the right time frame for that specific service was, we're not requiring every user to go home and immediately get on VPN. That was just not gonna be reasonable. It was gonna create a lot of other issues. So we had a lot of great wins there. There was on a, a day one scenario where we helped limit the impact on the infrastructure from a VPN perspective by having a solution that many users could do on a day-to-day -day basis that didn't require you know, loading up that client and getting that going. Uh, this also is really you know, looking at the pandemic and where we're at now. From our hybrid model, this has been really valuable because what this means is that uh, at Adobe anyway, we're at a model where now you don't have to go in every day, but a lot of people are coming in regularly. So maybe you work two, three days a week from the office and you know, a couple days from home or vice versa. We wanna make it easier for you to access your data without having to think about whether or not am I on VPN, am I in the office, you know, how am I getting connected to this infrastructure? And again, this hybrid model, because of the way we've set up our zero trust solution, you don't need to know whether you're on the network or if it requires VPN. You just simply put in the, the URL or use the tool that's been enabled and it just, in the background, seamlessly determines, you know, well, you're gonna go through the proxy in this solution or you're gonna go direct to the service because maybe it's a SaaS-based app, but you're still gonna go through our workflow that looks for, for the certificate. And all that happens without the user having to know anything about the service itself or where it might be hosted. I think another key piece too is this really helped us mature the approach um, from a pandemic perspective, pushed us to really mature the approach from a reliability and a cloud-like function. Uh, nothing like trying to make sure that, you know, the, what is the number now? close to 40,000 different users that access our data, um, not all of which use the solution, but majority of them do, can access it in a reliable way. So we really had to really spend a lot of time in order to maintain that high level of user experience to make sure that we had things properly you know, configured in the cloud, things were set up in all the right regions. Uh, there was our vendors were ready to support it in a way that really didn't limit us just because everybody was working from home. So all of those really helped us be what I think is really successful and get a lot of wins as to what it looked like. And then in addition to that, we're now at a point where initially we were going after teams to say, hey, we really wanna get your service into our workflow, it's important for us. They come to us, they come to, you know, there's a queue and we have a backlog of services that wanna be part of our service because they see the value of it, not just for um, their users, but for themselves. And I, you know, one of the things I would call out here is for any of you that have had to administer services in the past, you know, that was important to us is to not just do security for security purposes, but to make it valuable for the different people involved. And if, if you've ever tried to deploy something to a, a team or a group that's reluctant, that has to support it, you don't get very far. And so it was really important for us to make that as seamless for them as well. And that was one of the successes I think we really had. So talking just about a couple of our conclusions, things I wanted to highlight, um, nothing earth shattering. Uh, one of the first things is just that it was important for us to consider both the user environment, the user experience, as well as security when we made our decisions. This went into deciding everything from what do we want to support, what services do we want to go after, what platforms are important for us to include on day one. You know, and the one-size-fits-all approach, you know, that was important for us as well. You know, there was, um, for many of you, you've probably read the, uh, you know, Beyond Corp white papers or information from other big vendors. There's a lot of great information in there. But we weren't Google, so we couldn't do it exactly the way they did. So we tried to take what we could learn from that, 
do our own analysis, you know, going back to some of that logging information, other telemetry information, to figure out, well, what's, what really works for us in that use case, and what do we want to customize to our own, you know, use cases? Because our users are not identical. Uh, and that was really important for us, and it's something I'd say that, to take away for yourselves is how does this work for your own organizations, and what is it you're trying to accomplish, and do you have a good understanding of that? And then finally, you know, these investments really, I think, paid big dividends now that we're in a hybrid environment. You know, I, one, of the, uh, one of the other examples that I talked about is not just working from home, but this is the default way that M&As get onboarded to Adobe. Rather than, say, acquire a company and say, all right, here's a VPN solution with everything you might need plus a whole bunch of stuff you may never need and what risk that might pose, we can say, okay, we're going to use uh, your environment's going to be part of our zero trust environment. Here's the services you need. We'll do a certain amount of delegated explicit access to services where we also can validate the, the status of your device. Because maybe your device you know, was recently acquired and it's being integrated into our overall solution, so we can make real-time decisions then on whether or not you should have access and not treat every M&A just like it's been you know, with the company for 20 years and make some intelligent decisions there. That was actually a really big win, too. It was much quicker because it also meant you didn't have to deploy additional VPN clients maybe to machines, set up another you know, bunch of VPN routing rules about how you're going to manage all that and just make it as seamless as possible for a majority of the web services and other types of common applications that many of, your, uh, many of our M&A targets would use. And that's it. You know, I really uh, I appreciate your time. It was great to see everyone here. Great to be here in person. And, and I would really just you know, call out that being able to look at how, what you're trying to achieve and considering both the user environment and your security goals and making that overall decision, I think went a long way for us and is something you should consider for your own journeys. Thank you.